If you would like our free newsletters on various religious topics, just send us an email at cdebater at aol.com and free newsletters will be sent to you by mail. Just provide your postal address in your email. The following are samples of some of the newsletters we have available. Does God Believe in Atheists? Part 1 Seventh-day Adventism True or False? The Agony of Deceit The Origins of Muhammad's Religion Spiritual Warfare Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. From Tradition to Truth, a Priest's Story. An Evaluation of the Oneness Pentecostal Movement. Mormonism, Counterfeit Christianity. Turn or Burn. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceived Deceivers. Links to these newsletters can also be found at our website www.biblequery.org Once on the home page, simply click on the menu icon at the upper left hand corner. Then click on the newsletters button. Feel free to print them out. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. This is Larry Wessels for Christian Answers. I wanted to mention the fact that I think James White is one of the top Christian apologists in the biblically literate world. Most of evangelicalism, as so-called, and most of Christianity in general, is not biblically based. It's false Christianity. Most of the people that claim to be Christians are fake Christians. And the main reason is they just don't believe what the Bible says. It's really as simple as that. I mean, if you're going to be a real Christian, then you need to believe what the Word of God says. We've got a bunch of videos on that subject as well. Anyway, the scripture makes it clear that uh, you must believe the Word of God. But unfortunately, most people get into synchronism and want to just mix any old religion in with biblical terminology. And they end up with some mix mash of strange theology that God does not accept, if you're knowledgeable of what the Word of God says. So anyway, I want to let people know here that We've done a lot of videos with James White, and I just wanted to do a quick review of that for you on our YouTube channel. Now, he's got his own channel with, if you look on Sermon Notes, I think what was he got two, three, four thousand sermons over there. It's an amazing amount of material that's there, and I listen to all his Dividing Line programs uh, without fail, and uh, I've been greatly enriched theologically by doing so. But anyway, here's just a rundown, a brief, quick rundown for our viewers that are watching this right now, to uh, know that they can go to our YouTube channel and see some of the videos we have with James White. Uh, all you really have to put it in the YouTube search box uh, is James White C Answers TV, and that should give you our videos. I mean, you'll, he's got plenty of his own, so <laughs> it's no big deal, but we've got some with him. And, uh, of course, I highly recommend those to you. Okay, here we go. James White, number one true Bible apologist versus William Lane Craig, number one heretical apologist and others that claim to be Christian apologists. Well, at the same time, they claim to follow the Bible, follow Jesus, but then they deny the Bible. And like William Lane Craig does, he calls Jesus a liar. So, I mean, <laughs> what are you going to do with stuff like that? But anyway, this is a great little video to cover details on that particular person William Lane Craig. Here's another one called Boston College Debate Smackdown. James White and Rob Zins prove popes are a fraud and myth historically. And if you want to see just great historical evidence that these Roman Catholic popes are frauds, 
you'll hardly do better than what you'll see in this, this video here. Next, we have apostate Francis Chan joins heretic Mike Bickle's blasphemous ecumenical religion of lying prophets. And here you just have a horrendous display by Francis Chan, who here is pictured with uh, Benny Hinn, and these other charismatic heretics and Roman Catholics. The heresy is unbelievable, and this almost universalistic attitude that people hold that God's just going to accept anybody for any reason is ridiculous. And so this video will prove that. Next, we have Bogus Ticket Punch Gospel of Grace Evangelical Society, that's known as GES, and Sean Laser. No Repentance Salvation. And this covers people that say, well, you can believe anything, and it doesn't matter if you're a carnal Christian. You, can, it, you don't have to live the life. You don't have to repent. Jesus doesn't have to be your Lord. There's people like that that you can almost be an undercover Christian and you'll be okay. Uh, but that's not what the Scripture would have us uh, to, to believe. Okay, then we have Smells and Bells of Greek Eastern Orthodoxy, Lures Apostate Hanegraaff and Others to Strong Delusion. Now, Hank Hanegraaff took over Walter Martin's ministry uh, at the Christian Research Institute and has since then apostatized into Eastern Orthodoxy and uh, just, uh, just denies about every essential doctrine you can think of except for maybe the Trinity or something like that. But uh, just believing the Trinity, though, by itself is not going to cut it because not only do you have to have the right God, which, of course, is in the Trinity, uh, but you need other things uh, with that in the theological makeup of what being a Christian is. Then we have myths of the black Hebrew Israelites, theological racism, black King James only, apocrypha, and whites. Uh, so this will give you a good insight into that particular religious group that's out there. We have Dave Hunt's Calvinism attack, Confessions of a Heretic, Darbyism, Clement Brethren, Catherine Kuhlman. And so you have this very fascinating situation with Dave Hunt going against Calvinism and his background into you know, charismatics like Catherine Kuhlman, other things of that nature. Citywide call-in Bible Answers number 12, James White. Catholicism, two Babylons, baptism, Acts 2.38. There James came in and sat in my place on our uh, monthly show that we did, a live call-in Bible show called Fending the Faith. And uh, he did an excellent job there as usual. That's back, as so many people on YouTube have commented, uh, back when James had hair, when he was a young man. And then speaking of that, here's our next video, a video I did with him. Evidence that Jesus is God and the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation Bible is wrong. And there I am with James when he had hair, and he did a great job as usual when we're discussing the Jehovah's Witnesses. All right, another one here. Here's a picture with me and James again years later. This was taken in 2012. Anyway, it's called Highlights and Full Debate. Justification Before God, Dr. James White versus Dr. Robert Vestigi, part one of four. And, of course, you can see uh, James White there and Vestigi in a debate they did here in Austin, Texas at the uh, ACTV studio. And I was out in the camera crew for that video. Here's another one. Debate, Dr. James White accurately refutes irritating and misinformed King James only radio callers. Another one, New Age Bible versions and the King James only controversy, a refutation. And of course, I was in that particular video with James as well. Here's another one Dr. James White examines Mormonism, a religion created by Joseph Smith Jr. and believed by Mitt Romney. Another excellent radio show with. James White. Here we have James White, Acts 20, 27 through 32. A biblical church, preach whole counsel of God and beware savage wolves. Uh, that was given at my church, uh, Day Spring Fellowship in Austin, Texas. Is the Roman Catholic 
doctrine of the Virgin Mary biblical debate, James White versus Dr. Pastigi. This is another uh, segment of a, a multi-part debate series between Dr. James White and Dr. Robert Pastigi, who I also debated uh, back, back in those days, and uh, most informative. Next, King James Bible only debate. Is the King James Bible the only real translation? James White versus D.A. Waite. And this particular video has had a lot of views, and as you can see there by the, the view count, and that will really shed a lot of light on the whole King James only controversy. That was a radio debate, by the way, on my radio show that came on Saturday nights. Okay, is the Roman Pope without error? Papal infallibility debate. James White versus Dr. Prestige. That's another one of those uh, episodes in the series of debates with Dr. Robert Prestige, who is the head of the philosophy department at St. Edward's University here in Austin, Texas. Next do Roman Catholic indulgences really forgive sins? That's a, another segment of the, the debate, James White versus Robert Prestige. Now we have the Boston College debate number one, was Peter the first pope? White and Zins versus Syngenis and Butler, two Roman Catholic apologists. And the next one in that series of debates, Boston College debate number two, was Peter the first pope? White and Zins versus Syngenis and Butler. Here's another one of our videos with a clip from good old Dr. James White. It's called Free Tracks on Cults. Beth Moore edits her position on homosexuality in her book, Praying God's Word. Here's another one. Without Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone, who is telling the truth? That was another one of the shows I did while James had hair back long, long ago, but we covered Sola Scriptura and its importance because universalists and people that buy into Roman Catholicism and other religions, they, they hate Sola Scriptura because they don't want to go with the Bible alone. Because if you go with the Bible alone, you can't bring in all this extra stuff that's not in the Bible. And that's why Roman Catholics hate it, and so do a lot of the other, other religions. But here's just a quick sampling of some of the videos we have available with Dr. James White, who I believe is the top Christian apologist, and that's Bible apologist. I don't consider uh, William Lynn Craig and a lot of these other guys as Bible apologists because they spend almost as much time attacking the Bible as they do trying to argue for it. But anyway, that's your little introduction to some of the things uh, that have happened uh, with James with our ministry in years past. So God bless, and we'll go from there. some presentations that I made at a church in Texas. I think it was San Antonio. I'm, I'm, I don't remember. Uh, but I did a weekend on New Perspectivism. I know that at Grace Covenant Church in St. Louis, I did a weekend on New Perspectivism as well, though I don't know if those are online. I think somewhere my lectures specifically on... Um, N.T. Wright's book on Paul, what yeah, the Apostle Paul believed in justification, are available online. Yeah, I did actually get uh, one of your lectures. I forgot where it was. So, uh, I think of a great uh, uh, church that you just said, uh, spoke of. Uh, Day Spring uh, Fellowship, uh, right. Uh, Phil Johnson, of course, has, um, is an author in his own right, but also has probably edited more pages of text than most of us will ever read in our lives. And uh, editors, uh, editors are very important people, but they don't get uh, a lot of the kudos that they, uh, they really deserve. If uh, you have uh, found uh, materials online regarding uh, Charles Spurgeon, 
If you've uh, ever jumped on Google and uh, jumped onto Phil's site to read something from Spurgeon, uh, his site looked that good before any of the rest of us knew how to make websites look good. I'm not sure how he did that, but he managed to pull that off. And uh, in the midst of all this, he truly enjoys uh, the study of theology and the teaching of theology. And so I'm very thankful uh, to have Phil Johnson with us today. I hope you are listening. My assignment in this hour is to give a critical review of an influential book by Anglican author N.T. Wright, who is the Bishop of Durham. The book is titled, What St. Paul Really Said. And uh, it's a fairly thin paperback, fewer than 200 pages. Won't even stand up. And uh, although Wright is a prolific author, best known and most influential because of his massive scholarly works, this little book, which is written in a simple style for the, for the lay person, the serious lay person, really, ha- this book has undoubtedly been the most influential and perhaps the most controversial of all his published works. One of its aims is to explain the so-called new perspective on Paul in a clear and concise format so that lay readers can grasp the main ideas. The book is easy to read, it's thought-provoking, Wright is a gifted writer, his style in this book is warm and winsome, and in fact he no doubt anticipated that he would have critics when he wrote the book, and so throughout the book he makes every effort to disarm his critics. Evangelical readers who know Wright by reputation are likely to read him with great sympathy. In his other works, Wright has skillfully defended the historicity of Jesus, the truth of the resurrection against the skepticism and the liberal scholarship of people like the Jesus Seminar. And lots of evangelicals, therefore, know Wright best from his excellent work in this realm of scholarly apologetics. And we do owe him a great debt for the clarity and the force with which he has answered the left wing of contemporary scholarship. But it is my strong conviction that the position Wright lays out in what St. Paul really said is not an evangelical position at all. It's a faulty and dangerous reinterpretation of Paul, and it misunderstands Scripture in a way that fatally undermines the doctrine of justification by faith and the principle of sola fide, which is what our conference is about this weekend. Now, I'm going to show you why I believe that, and and at the end of my message, I want to give you as many biblical reasons for rejecting the new perspective as I can possibly sort of pack into the hour that I have. I'm going to edit my notes as I go, because we're short on time, and I don't want to to go over time like everybody else has done. But let me just start by explaining the basics of the new perspective on Paul according to N.T. Wright from this book, and then I'll give you some biblical arguments for why I think Wright's perspective is the wrong perspective. Now, I'll try to give you a thumbnail overview of this book as we go, what St. Paul really said. I'll highlight for you six distinctives of the new perspective according to Wright. I'll be quoting a lot from Wright, and I've tried to limit my quotations to what he says in this one book, so that when I quote him and simply give a page number, that's a reference from what St. Paul really said, published in the United States by Erdman's, copyright 1997. The same book is published in England by Lion Publishing Company. Now, here, according to N.T. Wright, is what St. Paul really said. He begins by giving us a sketch of the pedigree of 20... 20th century scholarship on Paul. I had intended to give you a sort of summary of that, but I'm going to edit that out for time's sake. Let me just say that he names a number of significant scholars, starting with Albert Schweitzer and going all the way up to E.P. Sanders and James D.G. Dunn. And virtually every name that's associated with the pedigree of the New Perspective is non-evangelical. Most of them would repudiate many of the doctrines you and I would deem essential to Christianity, starting with the authority of Scripture. Wright's point seems to be that the new perspective on Paul has an impressive scholarly pedigree. What I want to point out is that these views are rooted in the kind of scholarship that has historically been hostile to evangelical distinctives, such as the authority and the inspiration of Scripture. And it's ironic, I think, and not without significance, 
that the earliest exponents of this new expertise on Paul were all men who were happy to discard whatever portions of the Pauline writings didn't fit their theories. And so you have these experts on Paul at the foundation of this system who, frankly, reject a large portion of what the Apostle Paul really wrote. In short, that is not the kind of pedigree that ought to inspire the confidence of evangelical scholars. And I rather suspect that evangelicals would frankly have very little interest in the new perspective on Paul at all if it were not for the work of Wright, who many evangelical scholars respect for the work he has done in defense of the historicity of the res resurrection. Now, here are six distinctives of N.T. Wright's perspective on Paul, and I'll give them to you in a somewhat logical order. First of all, Wright begins with the assertion that New Testament scholars have badly misunderstood first century Judaism. This misunderstanding, according to Wright, actually dates far back, at least to the early fifth century, uh, during Augustine's battle with Pelagius. Wright also claims that this growing sort of misunderstanding of Judaism reached its zenith with Luther and the Reformers, in other words, historic Protestantism. Wright thinks evangelicals in particular have perpetuated a misunderstanding of Paul because of our systematic and theological approach to uh, the Bible, and uh, we're guilty, he says, of thinking in Greek categories rather than Jewish ones. We've been too prone to read Augustine's conflict with Pelagius back into the Apostle Paul, and Luther's conflict with Rome, same thing. And that has corrupted, he says, our understanding of the text and prejudiced our reading of the Apostle Paul and twisted up our understanding of Jewish culture during the time of Paul. But according to Wright and all the other proponents of the new perspective on Paul, Judaism in the time of Paul and Jesus did not teach any form of works righteousness. That's the claim they're making. Judaism, they say, had nothing in common with Pelagianism. Instead, according to Sanders and Dunn and Wright, who are the three prominent, most prominent living exponents of this view, all of them agree that if you study the records of Second Temple Judaism, there is a strong emphasis on divine grace, and there's a covenantal focus that rules out the notion of works righteousness completely. In fact, here's how Wright says it from page 32. He says, I'm convinced Ed Sanders is right. We have misjudged early Judaism, especially Phariseeism, if we have thought of it as an early version of Pelagianism. And he goes on to say, still page 32, this point is clearly of enormous importance, but I cannot do more than repeat it in case there's any doubt. Jews like Saul of Tarsus were not interested in an abstract, timeless, ahistorical system of salvation. They were not even primarily interested in, as we say today, going to heaven when they died." Unquote. And so, according to Wright, we have badly misunderstood Judaism, and that leads to a second key idea of the new perspective. Having misunderstood Judaism, we have therefore misinterpreted what Paul was saying against his against his critics, against the Judaizers. We've misunderstood all of Paul's polemics. Because obviously, if the Pharisees were not legalists, Paul could not have been arguing against legalism per se. He wasn't even primarily concerned with the question of how an individual can be right with God. Page 20, Wright says this, Despite a long tradition to the contrary, the problem Paul addresses in Galatians is not the question of how precisely someone becomes a Christian or attains a relationship with God. He says in parentheses, I'm not even sure how Paul would express in Greek the notion of relationship with God, but we'll leave that aside. He says the problem he addresses is this, should ex-pagan converts be circumcised or not? Now, he says, this question is by no means obviously to do with the questions faced by Augustine and Pelagius or by Luther and Erasmus. On anyone's reading, but especially within its first century context, the problem has to do quite obviously with the question of how you define the people of God. 
Are they to be defined by the badges of the Jewish race or in some other way?" Unquote. And Wright is explicitly acknowledging that if the new perspective is correct and first century Judaism had no issue with works righteousness, then all the traditional interpretations of Romans, Galatians, and all the other Pauline epistles must be thrown out the window and we have to go back to square one in our exegesis of the Apostle Paul. That's what the new perspective is all about. Now, Wright's critics, including me, have pointed out that this is a pretty audacious claim. Wright is claiming, in effect, that he is the first person in the history of the church, or at least since the time of Augustine, who has correctly understood the Apostle Paul. He doesn't really even agree with Sanders and Dunn. So he thinks he's the first person who's really understood the New Testament. John MacArthur responding to a brand new book by N.T. Wright. You recall this is a man who started off as a theologian who wrote well on the doctrine of the resurrection. Well, then, as the years passed, his trajectory was revealed as veering to the left when new perspectives on Paul appeared. It was quite clear where Dr. N.T. Wright was to some of us. Now it seems crystal clear, even though it's kind of hard to figure out exactly what N.T. Wright believes. Even in evangelicalism, there is what is now being called the new perspective on Paul. Uh, the primary uh, influence of that is coming from a man named N.T. Wright, who is a British theologian. He's written hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages on the gospel, including a very thick book on the resurrection of Christ. I have read books for years, as you would expect and you would know, and I have read his writings and they are a mass of confusing ambiguity, contradiction, and obfuscation. Mm. Academic sleight of hand. Mm. I cannot tell you what he believes after reading all of that. Wow. N.T. Wright might be a little fuzzy. John MacArthur, most certainly not. Warning of the dangers. Sometimes you read a book and you go, oh, I it makes you sound a little bit like Jerry Lewis. Why? Because it kind of... Why? So how do we know what N.T. Wright believes about the gospel? Well, it's a lot easier to figure out what he doesn't believe. But I can tell you exactly what he does not believe. The only time he gets explicit is to make sure we know what he does not believe. Let me quote. The new book by him, N.T. Wright, The Day the Revolution Began. Here is a quote. We have paganized our understanding of salvation, uh -oh. substituting the idea of God killing Jesus to satisfy His wrath yeah. for the genuinely biblical notion we are about to explore. Oh, I see. So he calls Jesus becoming the substitute that God killed to satisfy his wrath for us, paganism. Well then, you know, the doctrine over which the Reformation was fought, justification, penal substitutionary atonement, N.T. Wright calling it paganism. Hold on, it just keeps getting worse. -er -er. Further, he says, that Christ died in the place of sinners is closer to the pagan idea of an angry deity being pacified by a human death than it is to anything in either Israel's scriptures or the New Testament. Hmm. So he rejects substitutionary atonement. He rejects Jesus as the sacrifice that God chose to die for our sins. He is very clear on what he rejects. He rejects the idea that our sins are imputed to Christ. He rejects the idea that his righteousness is imputed to us. What is the big question of the Bible? The biggie, what must a man do to be made right with God? So I've got a question for N.T. Wright, if you're listening. Yeah. 
then how is a man made right with God? If it is not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, what do we do on Judgment Day? How do we face the wrath of God? How do our sins get forgiven? Please, N.T. Wright, let us know, because if penal substitutionary atonement is a pagan doctrine, then what are we, what is our hope, sir? I wonder if he's considered that, or is it possible he just doesn't think sin is all that big a deal? And maybe we're confused, too, about the anger and wrath of God. Maybe we're a little befuddled on the whole doctrine of hell, just like we are, supposedly, on the doctrine of justification? This is not the gospel, he says. This is paganism. Mm. To worship God as one who justifies by imputation, he says, is nonsense. That's the glorious doctrine that the Reformation was fought over. That's the, that was the mother of all doctrines right there. Imputation versus being infused with righteousness, credited as righteous. That's the gospel. N.T. Wright says it's not. I quote, if we use the language of the law court, it makes no sense whatsoever to say that the judge imputes, imparts, bequeaths, conveys, or otherwise transfers his righteousness to either the plaintiff or the defendant. Is he reading the book of Romans? Apparently not. Righteousness is not an object, a substance, or a gas which can be passed across the courtroom. This gives the impression of a legal transaction, a cold piece of business, almost a trick oh. of thought performed by a God who is logical and correct, but hardly one we want to worship. Wow. He goes on to say, no one will be justified until he reaches heaven. Well, then, one wonders how that works. Is the doc love strawman. Love it. You call it something that it isn't, and then clearly knock it over. N.T. Wright, another man with a beard and an accent. <laughs> He's going to teach us about a new perspective on Paul. Okay, not a good straw man, but that's the that's the modus operandi. Let's let's paint it as something that it's not to tell people how foolish he thinks it is. Further, he says, I must stress again that the doctrine of justification by faith is not what Paul means by the gospel. The gospel is not an account of how people get saved. Mm. Really? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel by which you are saved. That pretty much sums it up. N.T. Wright is N.T. wrong. And he's N.T. dangerous. And he keeps writing N.T. books. And there are more people that are following him. If we love the gospel, the glorious gospel, a penal substitutionary atonement, and we do, we fight over this one. Warn people of N.T. Wright. Ask your bookkeeper, or your bookshop keeper person, why are you carrying a book that is not orthodox? If you raised your hand, please come down front and uh, <laughs> someone will deal with you and take you to take you to our side room. We are having a membership drive, and uh, therefore, <clears throat> been there, done that, but we didn't sing enough, uh, enough uh, stanzas of Just As I Am to really make that work real well anyhow. So, uh, did you notice that was the theologically correct version of And Can It Be? How many of you noticed that that was the theolo- How many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? Uh, if, you, if you know And Can It Be, the third, the third stanza, as originally written, was uh, borderline heretical uh, in the sense, not just the atonement issue, but uh, in regards to the emptying of Christ. And uh, so the version we just sang had, had been redeemed. It was uh, fixed. So, uh, see, you didn't even know it. So, you're like, what? so what's he talking about up there? Well, uh, if you run into it in some older, uh, older hymnals, you'll see exactly what I was talking about. For those of you who are just uh, joining us, and I, you know, I was making a prediction. I thought we'd lose about 50% uh, after, after lunch, and we, it doesn't seem like we lost too many folks at all. So 
uh, either someone's paying you to be here or you all are actually very interested in, uh, in these issues. Um, actually, it would help if we you know, pr started providing an answer uh, to the things we've been looking at. But if you're just joining us, uh, there, is a, there was a handout out there. Uh, if you didn't get it, well, I'm only going to be reading a couple things anyway. It's probably not overly important. But um, we have been looking at the uh, subject of, uh, got some up front there. Um, the subject of new perspectivism, we've defined it, we've looked at a little bit of its background, uh, its emphasis upon the, the reason, the, the very reason for the term of new perspective is that it provides an entire new perspective in looking at the Apostle Paul, looking at what his intentions were, what his concerns were, and therefore what his teaching was concerning justification, salvation, the nature of the church, the nature of the covenant, uh, everything else. And that this new perspective, uh, which grew up primarily uh, after World War II uh, in a, a context in Europe and in America that was uh, very impacted uh, by a fear of anything that could possibly be considered anti-Semitic in light of the events of the Holocaust. Uh, there was a great concern about saying anything negative about Judaism. And since modern Judaism in its conservative forms is still uh, very much like the Judaism of the day of Christ. I mean, I, I moderated a debate in 1995 uh, between a, uh, a converted Jew, Michael Brown, and uh, Rabbi Shochet from uh, New York. And I remember to this day, as I was taking notes, it was the only time I'd ever moderated a debate. Uh, it was sort of fun to get to tell other people to shut up. But uh, um, uh, I remember as I was taking notes uh, that in my notes, uh, I, I made the statement, uh, ancient Judaism lives on. Uh, because what I was hearing from Rabbi Shachet, uh, both in its manner and in its substance, was very much... Uh, what I could identify uh, as uh, uh, the, the, the Phariseeism of the New Testament. And so it grew out of a, a, a situation where that was considered very, very important. There was a tremendous concern to see Judaism in the, in the most positive light possible. Uh, and therefore, the theory being that Second Temple Judaism, the Judaism of the days of Christ, uh, was not a, a merit-oriented system of work salvation, uh, but was, uh, uh, was very covenantal, that the law was understood as giving us signs of keeping the covenant, hence sometimes we hear it referred to as covenant nomism, uh, neo-nomism. There's various sundry terms that have been used by different people to describe it. Uh, but this new perspective has become extremely influential in uh, seminary circles, in Christian theology. And uh, we are looking specifically at the words of N.T. Wright uh, in his book, uh, What St. Paul Really Said, uh, because that is the most uh, uh, popular presentation, I would say, of that particular perspective and what it means. Now, we are to the point of providing a response. We were looking at Philippians 3.9 uh, before we uh, left. Uh, now I'd like you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And it is here, I think, that uh, if you can understand what Wright is saying, you'll at least have demonstrated an ability to sort of get inside someone else's perspective. Uh, but hopefully in the process, you'll be able to see uh, really how fundamental this whole movement is and how it changes the very definitions of what we, uh, what we believe in regards to the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of salvation. Uh, specifically, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, let's, let's back up just a little bit here because I think since he raises the issue of context, it might be good if uh, we look a little bit more at the context. Uh, you'll notice if you sort of look at your text of Scripture, chapter 3, uh, ministers of the New Covenant. He's talking about the ministry of the apostles um, and the, the ministry that was theirs amongst uh, the, the, uh, the people uh, in the preaching of the gospel, the difficulties that they had uh, in, in so doing, the glory of the New Covenant, uh, chapter 4. Uh, likewise, it talks about things similar to this, but for verse 7, for example, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, so the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God. God and not of ourselves. We are afflicted in every way. He's talking about the apostles and the, the difficulty of their ministry. 
Uh, and uh, then he continues on from there saying, we do not lose heart, verse 16 of chapter 4. Then chapter 5, he goes on to say that, uh, uh, that uh, Christians have this encouragement, uh, the temporal and the eternal. And uh, yes, he's talking about why apostles are doing these things. But obviously, chapter 5 begins uh, with talking about more than just simply the apostles uh, have, uh, when it says, For we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's not just true of apostles. Uh, this, is, this is a general truth of all Christians that, that helps to bear up the apostles in their afflictions, as well as bear up all Christians in their aff afflictions. And so he talks about this, uh, the fact that for indeed while we were in this tent, we groan being burdened and, and uh, all, all the rest of this kind of, uh, of, of discussion. And uh, then in verse 6, therefore being always of good courage and knowing that while we were at home, the body we were absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We were of good co courage, I say. Prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. This is all stuff that is, that is general to Christians as, as a whole. Yes, it explains the ability of the apostles to press on the face of difficulty, but it's true of all Christians as a whole. So picking up verse 11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now notice, he's just talked about, he's, first he's addressing a, a direct situation in Corinth. Uh, that is, there are these super apostles, you know, in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, there are those who were opposing the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Uh, they were putting themselves as being greater apostles than he was, and they were putting down his apostolic authority. But right in the middle, and you might say, why are you emphasizing this? Just note it, and you'll see why it's important in just a moment. Right in the middle of saying, well, you know, uh, we, don't, we didn't take pride uh, in, uh, in, a, in our appearance rather than in heart. He's talking about those, those apostles, false apostles who are opposing him. Right in the middle of that, he then says, for the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Now, he's making a, a point within the context of his argument we are concerned about the heart. We are not to live for earthly, fleshly things. But how does he do so? By bringing in a great overarching truth concerning the work of Christ. Now, why is that important? Just mark it down and you'll see why it is in just, just a moment. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, obviously, down through the years, uh, this passage, especially in light of the context, verse 17, the new creation, uh, the previous discussion of the death of Christ, uh, the, the forgiveness of trespasses, verse uh, uh, 19, uh, the preaching of reconciliation, verse 20. Uh, the, the verse, verse 21, has been understood to be the, the clearest delineation of what Luther called the great transaction. Uh, he who knew no sin was made to be sin in our place, on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, before we do anything more with that, let me explain why this is important by reading from N.T. Wright concerning how he understands this section of Scripture. Because remember, he has said over and over again uh, that it is a mistake to understand righteousness as something that comes from God. Uh, we saw in Philippians 3.9 that that was uh, just simply the badge of, of being in the Old Covenant or the New Covenant, and the badge of being included in the people of God. Here's what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
I have left the last, and you'll see in, the, in what I've typed out for you, uh, verse 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become in him the dikaiosune theu, righteousness of God. I have left the last critical phrase untranslated. This time it is certainly the righteousness of God. And generations of readers have taken it to be clear evidence for a sense in the lower left half of the diagram, the diagram on the preceding page, if you're just now looking at the, uh, at the handout, uh, most likely B1A, that is imputed righteousness. I have pointed out in detail elsewhere, and I provided to you, should you wish to pursue this, where that elsewhere was. He didn't bother to provide a footnote here, which I found very strange. Uh, I had to track it down myself, but uh, this discussion is found in Pauline Theology, Fortress Press, 1993. Uh, I have pointed out in detail elsewhere, however, that Paul is not talking about justification but about his own apostolic ministry, that he has already described this in chapter 3 as the ministry of the new covenant, that the point at issue is the fact that apostles are ambassadors of Christ, with God making his appeal through them, and that therefore the apostolic ministry, including its suffering, fear, and apparent failure, is itself an incarnation of the covenant faithfulness of God. What Paul is saying is that he and his fellow apostles in their suffering and fear, their faithful witness against all the odds, are not just talking about God's faithfulness, they're actually embodying it. The death of the Messiah has taken care of their apparent failure. Now in him they are the righteousness of God, the living embodiment of the message they proclaim. This reading of 2 Corinthians 5.21 ties the verse so closely into the whole surrounding context that it thereby demonstrates its correctness. If, however, you insist on reading 2 Corinthians 5.21 with a meaning in the second half of the diagram, presumably B1a, imputed righteousness, you will find, as many commentators have, that it detaches itself from the rest of the chapter in context, as though it were a little floating saying that Paul just threw in there for good measure. The proof of the theory is in the sense it makes when we bring it back to the actual letter, end quote. And that's a, a fairly good summary uh, in this book of, of the argument that he presents uh, in longer form, uh, the, the, the primary argument that he makes is this. Um, this can't be, as it has been understood, a, an overarching statement of the gospel, an issue of the great transaction, uh, the death of Christ in behalf of his people, he becoming sin for them so that they might have a righteous standing with God, the, the idea of the great transaction. It couldn't be that. Uh, because that would just be a floating story, just a little, a little pericope, a little uh, incident that's just thrown in, and it doesn't really bear any relationship to the surrounding context. That is something that he primarily emphasizes. Now, I, I don't know about you, but it seems to me that verse 21 uh, fits the context very well of verse 20. He's talking about how it is that someone can be reconciled to God. He's talking about the message that he is the ambassador for Christ delivers. And he delivers a message of reconciliation. Well, how can there be reconciliation? The reconciliation has been brought about by what God has done in Christ. He made him who knew no sin to be sent on our behalf so that we might become the righteous of God in him. That is how reconciliation can take place. That is the only grounds of reconciliation. So the idea that it's some detached statement, uh, I've never really quite understood. But remember what I emphasized just a few minutes ago. In the very immediate context, in illustrating a, a, a point concerning the church there at Corinth, he again brought in an overarching statement concerning the gospel and applied it right within that context. Now, is, is N.T. Wright going to tell us uh, that the discussion uh, in verse 15 is also just a detached thing and that in reality verse 15 isn't about the death of Christ in regards to people, but it's only in regards to apostles, that somehow this has some Something only to do with apostolic ministry or something along those lines. No, I don't think that he would do that. Besides that, think about the Apostle Paul for a moment. How many times when Paul just makes mention, for example, of the name of Christ, or makes mention of the word gospel, how often does he not then introduce an entire parenthetical statement, taking him sometimes verses to get back to the rest of the sentence, in fact, where he expands upon and, and heaps praise upon God's work in Christ in the gospel. 
I mean, he does this all the time. He, he's talking to Timothy, and he's saying in, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Timothy, you, you cannot be, uh, God has not given us a, a spirit of timidity. It seems that Timothy may have been, you know, one who withdraws a little bit, and it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, naturally one who could handle difficult situations and, and uh, opposition and things like that. And there was a danger that Timothy might, might sort of draw back from his duties as an elder in the church. And, and Paul is saying to him, Timothy, God, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of, but of a sound mind and discipline. And so he says, so, so don't, be, don't be ashamed of, of the Lord or, or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel. And then as soon as he says the gospel... He has to expand on that. He has to give this whole discussion about the eternal nature of the gospel and, and the wonder of the gospel. And then he goes back to exhorting Timothy. There's nothing at all unusual, and certainly he would know this, uh, of, of Paul when he makes mention of something to then expand upon it and explain how can we proclaim this message of reconciliation? How can we as ambassadors, what's the, what's the authoritative basis that we would have? Well, it is what God has done in Christ. It is this substitutionary atonement. But let's think about it for a moment. If you can, if you can put yourself in his mind then what you're hearing then is, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us, and emphasize the us. We, the apostles, beg you, who aren't, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our apostles' behalf, so that we, apostles, might become the incarnation of his faithfulness in Christ. Can't get it in there? Can't, can't quite read it that way? He says, well, it immediately goes on, working together with him. We also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain and all the rest of this stuff. And see, it goes right on from there. Yes, and it went right on from there in verse 15 as well. Uh, the, the argument I just find to be in, incredibly weak, especially when you have to turn the phrase, the righteousness of God, into the embodiment of God's faithfulness. Right upon speaking of the death of Christ, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Well, Paul would mention that and then not say anything more about it. Not, not says anything more about it. He immediately goes back after saying that to talk about uh, we, be, we are the, the embodiment of the faithfulness of Christ. I, I, think, I think despite uh, Dr. Wright's rightful saying that we should allow Paul to speak for himself, at this point of time, we have an excellent example of where the overarching theory that has been developed simply doesn't fit into the text in which it is being forced. And so a passage that speaks to us of God's purpose in Christ, making him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that is taken away, in essence, from the Christian people. The... the, the Meaning of that passage is limited to a particular time, a particular circumstance, in which the apostolic ministry was made an embodiment of God's faithfulness. Now, I guess we can then all look back upon that and go, isn't it wonderful uh, that despite all the difficulties that the apostles faced, God was faithful to them? Uh, but... That doesn't sound to me as if it really is what Paul's intention was when he starts speaking of him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. What does that mean? I mean, that, talk about substitution. What does it mean that, 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 that God made him to be sin? This is one of the things that's concerned me very much in reading not only this, but the aforementioned further study. What does it mean for God to consider Christ in this way. He made him to be sin. Did Christ become sinful? What does this mean? Well, if we go back to old perspectivism, <laughs> I guess that's a term we can use. <clears throat> if we go back to not-so-new perspectivism, uh, we learn much from this passage. I mean, Christ did not become constituted a sinner in the sense of he was not made made unholy by what God did any more than when we are considered the righteousness of God that we somehow are in the Roman Catholic sense 
intrinsically and internally made into something that's pleasing to God, and that's why we go to heaven. This is what imputation is all about. This is, this is, this is the foundation of all of those things, and all of that becomes very relevant to where we are today, but it's rather much taken away from us if we understand it in the way that it's presented here. The natural reading of passages like Philippians 3, 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 simply doesn't flow from new perspectivism as it is presented. And I think the fact that he focuses upon these passages, uh, he recognizes that as well. It also does not flow in the book of Romans. We listen to Romans chapter 3 as it was presented by N.T. Wright. But I would also point you to Romans chapter 4, uh, which again, I think, ends up having a, uh, it, its, its teeth removed, shall we say, in what is being said. He says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham <coughs> excuse me, was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So in other words, if Abraham, in the New Perspectivist reading, if Abraham was made a part of, of the covenant by things he did, if he was made, uh, if he joined the group by what he did, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now that's a tough one too. Uh, in other words, I believe God, and therefore God pronounces uh, that I am right with him because I have believed, not because of what someone has done in my behalf. Then this is where it really gets tough, because verses 4 through 9 have always been, for me, the, the key passage in regards to justification by faith. Now, to the one who works. Now, remember what works are in new perspectivist thinking. What are works? Well, they're not meritorious. The Jews didn't believe in that. It's the one who in, embraces the covenant signs, the external signs of being a part of the people of God. So let's see if we can read this passage in a new perspectivist way. Now, to the one who engages in these external works, non-meritorious works, uh, that, are, uh, that are part of the covenant signs, his wage... No, well, wait a minute. But, but there's no merit involved here. So where does the word wage come from? This is the standard word for wage. It is what is owed to someone. When, when you go to work and you put in your 40 hours, uh, you are owed a certain amount of money. That's the Greek term that is used here. Why would Paul use the term wage... If the works he's talking about were not considered to be meritorious on the part of the person who committed them. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, literally according to grace, but as what is due, what is owed. Again, standard Greek terminology for payment in regards to services rendered. <coughs> but to the one who does not work, which, in the new perspectivist idea, would be the one who does not engage in, in the external uh, signs of the old covenant, circumcision, whatever, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Believes in him who justifies the ungodly. Now, how does that work? in a new perspectivist reading. I mean, I think I know what justifies the ungodly means because it's based upon the work of Christ, there's a ground of substitution, there's atonement. But I guess that would be understood as who, who justifies the ungodly in a sense of, of, of putting the ungodly into the family of God, but that doesn't sound quite right either who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. His faith is credited as the sign that he is in the family of God, just as David also speaks the blessing to the man to whom God credits, that's imputes, I thought that was sort of a legal fiction type thing, righteousness apart from works. Now here's where it really falls apart, because if you're familiar with this passage, you know that one of the glories of Romans 4, 6-8, is that here Paul gives us an, an apostolic inspired interpretation of an Old Testament passage. And his interpretation is that in verses 7 through 8, which is from Psalm 32, David is speaking about 
God crediting righteousness apart from works. That's a positive action. Now, to credit righteousness apart from works in New Perspectivism would seemingly be to say you are in the family of God without having to embrace uh, circumcision and the external marks of the covenant. But verse 7 says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Notice that the psalmist's words are all negative in the sense of blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Those are redemptive terms. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not. No, never. It's an error subjunctive of strong denial. The, the, the Lord will never, in any possible way, take into account the sins of the blessed man. And so the imputation of righteousness here has nothing to do with external covenant signs. It has to do with the forgiveness of sins. And so the apostle understands the forgiveness and the non-imputation of sins. And that's what you have in verse 8, is the non-imputation of sins. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not impute to him. The apostle understands the crediting of righteousness apart from works to be what the psalmist is referring to in the forgiveness of sins and the non-imputation of sins. And if you lost the whole idea of new perspectivism and external covenant signs and, and Jewishness and stuff like that, there's no wonder because it just doesn't fit in there. That's not what Paul's talking about. He is definitely cutting at the Jewish objections to his position. There's no two ways about it. But he's doing it in the way that, well, that we've always thought he was doing it. <laughs> not in the way that new perspectivists or those who held that view earlier, uh, mainly from the Roman Catholic perspective, uh, believed. It just simply doesn't fit into uh, this concept. And it goes on, is this blessing then on the circumcised or the uncircumcised also? For we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, while uncircumcised. The point being there is, don't you see? Abraham was righteous before God before there were any works that he could do, before there, he was in the uncircumcised state. Circumcision was given later. His standing with God had already been established by faith. And that, of course, cut directly at the Jewish apologetic against the proclamation of the gospel. And so it, it's, it, it is easy, for I think, for some people to come to the conclusion that what you have here is scholarship versus old-time religion. And it's not. Um, that is not the case at all. Uh, there are those who are working on extensive point-by-point -point refutations. Uh, some of you know that um, I think D.A. Carson uh, uh, edited a, uh, the first of a series of volumes that's in response to this, uh, specifically on, on uh, Second Temple Judaism, which the vast majority of folks would, would never be able to plow through this thing. Uh, because it's incredibly technical and, and very much based upon resources that are not generally available to the vast majority of us, even if we had an interest in, in trying to delve into them. But uh, the, the point is, it's not scholarship versus non-scholarship. It is very frequently placed within that context. It's not. Uh, instead, one of the reasons I started with some of the quotes that I did uh, even included the little, the little quote about, uh, about Schweitzer uh, as a lonely and learned giant amidst the hordes of noisy and shallow theological pygmies. Uh, the quotations uh, misrepresenting the Reformed perspective and, and things like that. There are many other factors involved in the creation of this system. It is not some unbiased scholarly conclusion versus the old traditionalists who just simply won't admit that their system has been wrong all along. It is interesting to me that one of the most disagreeable, unkind, uh, uh, I don't know how else to describe him, individuals I've ever debated. Just It was just very, very... Uh, 
uh, I, I've only done one debate with the individual, and, and uh, that's probably best. A um, man by the name of Dr. Art Sippo uh, finds new perspectivism uh, to be Protestant uh, affirmation and confirmation that the Reformation has been wrong all along. They find in this teaching the, the very foundational elements of the Tridentine view of the Council of Trent. Now, I, I, don't, I don't buy that. In fact, I know some Catholic apologists who don't buy it either because new perspectivists generally uh, don't like any type of creedal formulation at all, whether it's Rome's or somebody else's. Uh, but it is true that this movement has, um, in its application, uh, dulled or ended individuals or groups belief in the necessity of evangelism of, for example, Roman Catholics. I don't see how a new perspectivist uh, could view the need to evangelize Roman Catholics. He may feel that we need to dialogue with Roman Catholics because they're confused about the Pope uh, or they're too encased in tradition. Uh, but the idea of it being a, a life and death, the salvation of the soul or the loss of the soul issue, uh, it would be very difficult to understand why that would be. Um, and so this whole movement does have a tremendous amount of relevance to where we are today. In fact, you might say, great, we were already living in a day and age where most people didn't know what the doctrine of justification by faith was anyways. We're living in a day where most people are considerably more familiar uh, with uh, the dangers of being left behind uh, than, they are, uh, than they are with the dangers of confusing imputed with imparted righteousness, as if for most people that was even an issue. Uh, and then to have the people who should know better uh, to then be engaged in conflict over the very nature of justification for enough folks, it's enough to make you want to throw your hands up in the air and say, look, nobody knows. And I've seen a lot of people that, that do that. I'll confess, I, I will see people, especially students who go into, into seminary, and they're exposed to all this tremendous spectrum of, of viewpoints. And, and many of the people who hold all these different viewpoints, very nice individuals. Very nice individuals. And so it's very easy to, to go, you know what? If, 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 if someone as brilliant as N.T. Wright uh, can, can get that far off on this, and he's, but he's right on other things, but he's off on that, and there's this view over here, and there's that book over there, and there's this view over here, and historically there have been all these different movements, who are we to think we could ever get it right? And people who buy into that, people who embrace that, you know, what he really knows, are going to be the last people in the world to ever open their mouth and take a stand on anything. And so it eats away at the fervor of the proclamation of the gospel. It certainly makes words like Paul's in 2 Corinthians 5. We are ambassadors for Christ. When was the last time you saw an ambassador, at least in the ancient context, we certainly see it in our context, but in the meaningful term of ambassador, who would show up and I think I represent King so and so. I'm not really sure what he had to say, though. Hold on just a second. You know, that wouldn't be an ambassador who would be overly impressive. It wouldn't be an ambassador whose message you could even trust. The ambassador needs to be certain who he serves and what his message is. And so, not only then do we have what, what, what we have here is the 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 end product of creating a theological system that does not start with a belief in the absolute consistency, perspicuity, and inspiration of all of Scripture. Now you say, well, N.T. Wright holds a very high view of Scripture. Yeah, he's not an inerrantist, though. Well, but it's higher than most people. Yeah, maybe. But you see... He, he thinks that E.P. Sanders' point is established, and he works from there. But Sanders and other people like him dismissed whole sections of the New Testament text as being non-original. All of what Jesus taught about the Jews 
Yeah, that sort of affects your theory, I think, if you're trying to come up with what the Jews were like. Well, we can't really take into consideration Paul's own words about them. We can't really take into consideration Matthew 23 and Luke 16. And yet, because that's all in the past and it's, it's really not a major portion of this, then for some reason it manages to sneak into churches that once confessed but maybe didn't think through as well as they needed to the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture. It's almost like because of all the battles over inerrancy in the 70s and 80s, it's like, well, that battle's done. Really? That's just something that the fundamentalists argue over. And in most of theological education today, that is true. It's something only fundamentalists argue over. Because there seems to be a whole generation of seminary professors today who, because the seminary says you need to believe it, will say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that. But in reality, where the rubber meets the road, in the exegesis of the text of Scripture, you see, if you believe in inerrancy, that means, see, sola scriptura and inerrancy go together. Sola scriptura means the Scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith of the church. And that means that's God speaking to us. We take seriously Jesus' view. That's God speaking. We take seriously Peter's view. Holy men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's Paul's view. All Scripture is theanustos, God breathed. And if you believe that, then you don't create your theology by the henpeck method. You listen to all of what Scripture has to say. And that all becomes the guide and the guard for getting off balance and ignoring some things and overemphasizing other things. And if you don't start there, the root and the foundation will always be rotten. And a conservative who stands upon a rotten foundation is no more stable than a liberal who stands upon a rotten foundation. He just looks weirder. <laughs> it just doesn't look right. But that's what we have going on today. And so, yeah, did we need it? No. Has our job been made more complex by it? Sure has. I mean, we could have spent this day talking about uh, how to deal with Roman Catholics on justification, or we could have talked about the Mass, or we could have talked about uh, the new Mormon apologetic. There's all sorts of stuff we could have done, but we couldn't, because we had something else we needed to discuss. So it's complicated in that way. Whole new area. Has it complicated my job when I debate a Roman Catholic on, on uh, justification? You bet. What can he do? <laughs> you, you don't even represent uh, the best of Protestantism. See? Read that. See? What, your, your whole understanding of Romans 3 and righteousness. See? One of the most powerful Anglicans in the world says you, you don't know what you're talking about. You've been twisting the text of Romans for years. Does that mean he wins the debate? No, it just means that there's a whole other area that you have to deal with. A whole other line you have to draw. A whole other question that you have to answer. So, yeah... It does, it's, it's easy if, if you are of the, the kind of thinking to where you always focus upon the negative. And, you know, we all sometimes slip into that. It'd be easy to say, oh, here we go again. And eventually just throw your hands up in the air and say, it's just, it's just not worth it. You know, I only semi-jokingly uh, talk about moving to Alaska and opening up a tire shop, sell SUV tires up in Alaska, and so just, you know, let the whole thing go. Uh, it's easy to become discouraged because the, the fight, it just never ends. Of course, it's been that way all the way through church history. And if we're the kind of person that sort of looks at things like that, you get discouraged after a while, it's easy. But you know what? At the same time, there are a lot more folks thinking about what it means to be justified today than there might be otherwise. In fact, you know what? God has a way of bringing good even out of messes like this. You know, and I, I've, I've written some books in responses to what other people have written in books. And when I first saw those people's books, I was like, oh, man, this is going to cause so much confusion. It's going to cause so much damage. And then, you know what, in hindsight, you look back and go, you know what? A lot of folks were blessed because of that. I didn't see it, but, you know, the Lord has a way of doing that kind of thing. 
And so I try to keep that type of an attitude. It's not easy to do, but I try to keep that type of an attitude here. It's nothing new. Oh, the, the lines are definitely different than they were at the Reformation. Yeah, we have to keep drawing those lines and we have to keep defining our position and being clear in our presentation. But you know what? We live in a post-Christian, post-modernist society anyways. We can't be comfortable anymore in thinking that people outside the confines of our community are going to allow us to get away with speaking Christianese and not really thinking through our faith very well anyhow. We need to think these things through, whether there was a new perspective to force us to do so or not. And so the Lord sometimes uses these things to just prod his people along. Lord's still in control. God's not sitting up in heaven going, oh, I don't know what to do about this new perspectivism. I just, you know, you know, he's, they, he has, he's not doing that. As much as we'd like to think he's like us like that, he, yeah, it doesn't work that way, and I'm awful glad. So, what do, we, what do we conclude? Well, another illustration. Another illustration of the absolute centrality of having a clear and consistent high view of God's holy word. Oh, I know that may sound, start to sound old to people. But believe me, in dealing with all the issues that I deal with, and I don't deal with them all, I'm not one of those apologists who will, who will say to you, I can answer any question you ask. There's lot, you can ask me lots of stuff. I'll sit there and go, I don't know. Ask me about eschatology. Where did, uh, where did Dr. Long go? <laughs> yeah, don't ask me. There's, there's a, dozen, a dozen books I'd have to read to even begin to make heads or tails. And every time I try to do it, something like this comes along. And I go, okay, I'm going to leave that to somebody else. You know? So I'm just not one of those folks. that uh, There's lots of things you could ask me. But everything that I have dealt with, whether it be Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholicism, liberalism, uh, the destruct, destructive criticism of the text of Scripture, atheism, whatever it is. Every single one of those areas, and many of them are very different from one another, has caused me to again recognize each and every time that the real central issue is really goes back to someone who said a long time ago, Yea, hath God said? Not much has changed. The approach has changed, the words change, but really the question is, has God said? Is that really the word of God? Is it really sufficient? Is it really God speaking? If you believe that it is, if you believe like Jesus Christ, and I've never been able to figure out anyone who trusts Jesus Christ to raise him from the dead, but doesn't trust him enough to hold his view of Scripture. Never figured that part out of you. Oh yeah, Jesus Christ, my Savior. But he really didn't, he didn't have access to everything we know about Scripture today. <laughs> I mean, he, in his day, I know he thought Moses wrote that stuff, but we, we have the graph wall housing documentary hypothesis. We, we're a little more enlightened. I've never understood that part. I trust him to save my soul. I just don't trust his view of Scripture. I don't understand it. If we have that view of Scripture, the sufficiency of Scripture, then we have a clear revelation. God's Word is so balanced. And if we'll just stay in it, instead of wandering around the theological landscape, and that sort of takes us back to what I said at the beginning. I don't know what has caused this discontentment on the part of so many. I don't know what it is. I know one thing. A sound, healthy, discerning church is a blessing on a land. And when I consider what our land is doing, when I consider that the, the leading Judges in our land and unrighteous judges are a curse on a people. Our intent upon granting to those who rebel against God's law free reign to exercise their sinfulness in our society, I go, why should God bless this land with a discerning church in the first place? 
And then you go, well, then what are we supposed to do? Well, as a Christian, you only have one duty. Be faithful to God wherever he puts you. It doesn't matter if you're in the minority or not. You be faithful to God. Might we be someday the minority amongst those who are called Protestants in regard to our view of justification? Well, I hate to tell you this, but if you're Reformed, you already are. <laughs> Shouldn't be anything new. Should that bother us? Yeah, it sure bothers me. In fact, the day it stops bothering me is when I need to get that tire shop going. But does that mean I become discouraged? No. We need to press forward. We need to understand what we believe. We need to communicate what we believe to others. We need to recognize the, the glory of what it means that he made him who knew no sin to be sin in our place. So we might be made the righteous of God in him. That, that seamless robe of righteousness that only will avail before a holy God. A people who do not consider that to be a precious truth, well, you know what? They just might lose that truth. Scripture says those who are being saved love the truth. Those who are perishing refuse to love the truth. You know what happens if you refuse to love the truth? God sends you a lie, and he makes you love it. And that happens a lot, and it's a sad thing to see in any person who could ever take any pride or arrogance in knowing better than someone else, doesn't really understand the nature of grace at all. Throwing a lot of stuff at you, it went a little bit too fast. When I started reading those, all those statements, I started realizing, man, there's so many things I've got to explain about this. I don't know how I'm going to do it in the, in the time period. But hopefully it has given you at least an understanding of why there is such a brouhaha going on why it's important to know what you believe about these things, and maybe no matter what church you're a part of, maybe now you'll be a little bit better prepared to maybe see it when it starts coming in. I'm not saying you necessarily have to stand at the door as a doctrinal watchdog, you know, checking out what books people are carrying, you know. <laughs> not suggesting that. But we do need to pray for our churches. And we do need to pray for the proclamation of the gospel uh, as it takes place. Well, I'd like to take some uh, questions for a few moments. Uh, it is 3 o'clock, so those of you who have a uh, uh, pressing appointment or something, but we'll take uh, questions for just a few minutes. Um, and uh, maybe what I should do, I could probably head off a few questions right off the bat, is one of the most common questions that has been asked, and I've only mentioned it briefly, but in the breaks, has been what is the relationship between what we are talking about here and the Auburn Avenue Presbyterian Church conferences, Douglas Wilson, Steve Schlissel, uh, John Barrich, Steve Wilkins, Norman Shepard, etc., etc. Um, and I'll, let me just briefly, for a moment, uh, mention um, there are similarities in the conclusions that certain of those men have, have reached. And by the way, you, you can't assume that everything that is presented at the Auburn Avenue Presbyterian Church conferences, which, by the way, you can listen to online for free uh, at sermonaudio.com if you want to look them up, uh, that each person agrees 100% with the other person. Some of them are pedo communists for, for example, and some are not. Uh, so there's not a single uh, necessary definition. Uh, the primary concern that has been expressed by the men at the Auburn Avenue Presbyterian Conference is what's called the objectivity of the covenant. That a person is joined to the new covenant by baptism and that we must take that seriously. That we have er erred in viewing the covenant through the lens of election, the decree. And what they're saying is we need to reverse that. We need to look at the decree through the lens of the covenant. And that is what has led um, to these individuals basically making statements uh, concerning the nature of uh, justification, the nature of the church as such, that, for example, to deal with Roman Catholics, uh, the best way to deal with Roman Catholics is to grab them by their baptism. 
uh, that their baptism uh, does uh, unite them to Christ, and their baptism does unite them to the covenant. And therefore, uh, in the extreme words, and I confess that they are extreme, but they have been confirmed by a number of people from that perspective, in the extreme words of, of one individual with whom I encountered, uh, the Borgia Popes, and if you don't know who the Borgia Popes were, Lucretia Borgia, they actually lived, believe it or not. That's not just some horror movie. Uh, they, were, they were some of the most corrupt, murderous, raping, pillaging uh, part, uh, members of the papacy ever. I mean, they were just massive corruption by the papacy, have brothels in the Vatican, you know, I mean, just as low as you can go, uh, as low as the pornocracy was during the 10th century, uh, you have the Borgia Popes. Uh, I have had folks who are, uh, attend the, the uh, AAPC conferences uh, say the Borgia Popes are as much our fathers in the faith as any 16th century reformer. And you say, why? Because they were baptized in a Trinitarian fashion. And if you're baptized in Trinitarian fashion, there's the objectivity of the covenant. You're in. That's it. Therefore, the grounds of dealing with that person is grab them by their baptism and say you need to be faithful to your covenant obligations. And the, the new perspectivism and Auburnism are coming at the issue from completely different perspectives. New perspectivism, as I've pointed out, comes out of a much more liberal viewpoint that does not embrace inerrancy. Everyone that I know of at Auburn Avenue believes in inerrancy. So they're coming from a very conservative perspective. And yet, Steve Schlissel, one of the speakers at Auburn Avenue, uh, quoted Luther's statement that the doctrine of justification is the article of a standing or falling church. And his comment to that was, that is hooey and hogwash. That's what he said about Luther. Luther's statement that justification is the, the article, the standing or falling church, is hooey and hogwash. He says justification simply means Jews and Gentiles are both a part of the covenant on the same basis, nothing more. And he says he's not read N.T. Wright. Um, so what ends up happening, because in the Auburn Avenue perspective, what then happens is, as long as you're baptized, you're a part of the covenant. And therefore, what do you do with people who apostatize? They'll say they believe in the perseverance of the saints. But what they mean by that is we can't know who's going to persevere. Only God knows from the decree. There are people who are truly a part of the church. You're truly a part of the new covenant through baptism. And they're going to apostatize. Therefore, the only way to really know who is and who isn't in the final analysis is at the end. And hence, there's an emphasis upon eschatological justification. And we've already heard that from the new perspective itself. And so many of the conclusions, though they're coming from, well, it's not 180 degrees, but they're coming at it like this. Many of the conclusions are starting to coincide on this issue of justification. Now, Douglas Wilson has said, I'm not a new perspectivist. And he has rightly pointed out in an appendix to his book, Reformed is Not Enough, uh, that new perspectivism is wrong in his view of first century Judaism. And he referred to many of the same passages that I would refer you to uh, where the New Testament describes the, the Judaism of Paul's day and uh, would say that that is far more accurate than any reconstruction that we can come up with later on. He is the least that direction of any of those individuals that I know of. Uh, John Barrich, however, will use the terminology and use the terminology at Auburn Avenue that the person baptized is regenerated, in a sense. What in a sense means becomes the issue. What does that, what does that uh, really mean? And so they do differentiate themselves, and yet many of the same issues are coming up. Um, and they are coming from different perspectives, and so we have to try to listen to each one on their own grounds. Um, but I think there is real reason to be concerned uh, I know many a Presbyterian friend of mine who is very concerned, uh, especially, uh, but it is, crossing, it is crossing over denominational lines, even though central to the presentation so far, at least, of the Auburn Avenue folks, is, is that their, primar their primary targets are Southern Presbyterians. 
Uh, in fact, they, will, they are extremely anti-Puritan. They think Jonathan Edwards was a bad, bad man. Um, mainly because they, they really believe that it's wrong for you to look for evidences of regeneration. God has not made you a fruit inspector. Uh, and in fact, to look for evidences of regeneration in a person's life is to question the validity of their baptism. And uh, so they this would especially have, are especially harsh in their, their sermons at Auburn Avenue on their Presbyterian brothers uh, who would be Southern Presbyterian in their viewpoints, Thornwell, Dadney, things like that, uh, who would call their children to faith and repentance in Christ. They're very strongly opposed to that. Uh, they do not believe there is an ordo salutis in the sense of uh, the, the, the normal way in which people are brought into relationship with Christ from their perspective is through the covenant. And so to call for a, a, an experience of repentance and faith is to question the promises of God in baptism. And they have called their Southern Presbyterian brothers wet Reformed Baptists. Isn't that nice? Uh, wet Reformed Baptists is the terminology used. Uh, and one of the, I think, I'm not sure if that was Wilson or, or who it was, or maybe it was Steve Wilkins that used that, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, their, their, Southern Baptist, uh, their Southern Presbyterian friends they call wet Reformed Baptists. And uh, so when I talk to my Southern Presbyterian friends, I say, come on over, the water's fine. <laughs> So, um, uh, so uh, maybe that'll, that'll answer some of the questions that, that uh, like I said, there were a number of questions concerning uh, Auburn Avenue that were, uh, that were offered there. So do we have some, some others in just a few moments? Yes, sir. What did, what did they do with the uh, death of Christ, I guess? Uh, what, what, what's the purpose behind the death of Christ? Is it like Catholic? Well, uh, you know, th th that's just it. Uh, the, the doctrine of atonement uh, seems to be one of the major casualties here. Um, certainly the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ is affirmed. Uh, the necessity of it is affirmed. Um, but it, it seems, as, as I look at what is said concerning it, that the emphasis is focused much more upon the demonstration of God's covenant faithfulness in the giving of Christ uh, than the concept of substitutionary atonement, union of the elect with, with Christ. Uh, it, it's really uh, placed into a, a, a different category of relevance. And I would assume, uh, and again, I'm only talking about right here, because once you get as... as, as uh, far to the left from my perspective, as many of the previous writers, um, you, you just, you can't know enough how much of the text they actually take seriously uh, and allow into the conversation to know really how to interact with their, their viewpoint. But it does seem that they would be a little bit more comfortable with some of the older views of atonement where the, the death of Christ uh, demonstrates something about God but is not truly substitutionary um, than they would be with a, a full-blown substitutionary format. Um, so that's, that's one of my concerns is uh, I don't see how a, a, his, a historically reformed understanding of the atonement uh, can be made to really fit within uh, the, the, the foundation's gone. You know, it's, it's like some of the defenders have, have said to me, well, look, you can still believe everything you believe. And I go, wait a minute. If all the classical passages upon which I've based my belief, I've misinterpreted them, then why should I want to believe what I believe? But you've got to remember, from many of their perspective, you don't have to necessarily derive a belief from Scripture. Because, you know, remember, N.T. writes a what? He's an Anglican. And Anglicans make a lot of room for tradition. And so what they're basically saying, you know, you may, may recall the statement that was read before, uh, it's at the bottom of the first page, I am perfectly comfortable with what people normally mean when they say the gospel. I just don't think that is what Paul means. Well, we generally don't feel comfortable with people saying things that are not scriptural. But see, from their perspective, that's not an issue. Hey, it's the tradition of your church. Tradition's fine. Tradition's great, fine, wonderful sort of leaves you in a situation of not being able to practice apologetics, but uh, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so that, that's one of my questions, is I, I don't see how it fits. I, I see the foundations being washed away at that point. 
Oh, come on. The, uh, the uh, lunch can't have, have knocked all of your uh, brains out. Of I saw that back there. Uh, yes, sir. The new perspective uh, emphasizing uh, eschatological uh, justification. What basically in your readings have you found uh, to be the basis on the grounds of that justification in the eschaton? Really good question. Um, the, the bent that, uh, that I see is really goes to saying, well, see, that's what James is talking about. And so James is talking about doing good works, uh, and the doing of those good works then becomes the means of demonstrating one's covenant faithfulness. Uh, and you might go, well, wait a minute. Uh, if you do good works to demonstrate your covenant faithfulness, uh, can you not do those good works and yet receive that final eschatological justification? Uh, seemingly, the answer would be no. Uh, but there's two bents there. See, the problem is, with new perspectivism, is that it certainly lends itself to that. But since it comes from a non-inerrantist position, and hence establishing a truly divine authority becomes problematic, it also lends itself toward a more of an inclusivistic perspective. Um, I mean, for example, when you consider a John Sanders or a Clark Pinnock, um, they could look at this kind of, of, of a perspective and have no problem with it at all. Because how do you define faith in Jesus? I mean, we see many Roman Catholics today uh, saying that any positive faith move toward God is faith in Christ, whether they know him or don't know him. And so you could easily, from that, it would almost be easier from that perspective for this to feed into a form of inclusivism. Uh, and say that the whole issue of atonement and justification is really irrelevant, that uh, God, has, God has proven, in fact, there are a number of statements, and I think you said you've, you've read this book, there are a number of statements in here where God has set everything right in Christ. Okay, that's true, but what does that mean? And it'd be very easy to interpret that as basically saying, you know what, the whole sin problem is taken care of for everybody. And as long as you make a positive faith move toward God, and you can define that any way you jolly well want to, um, then everything's going to be fine and everything's going to be dandy. And, and you don't have to know justification by faith to be justified by faith as long as that faith exists. Now, that's one of the other problems that I have uh, in regards to the definition of faith, is that I think faith has a specific object in the New Testament, and it's, it's not quite as narrow as it's defined in the, in the new perspective. There was a... Uh, yes, sir? Yeah, forgive me if this is similar to what you've already answered, but at the end of the day, from the new perspectivist viewpoint, uh, whose righteousness are you standing before God in? I mean... Well, see, the, the, question, the question is, whose righteousness are you standing before God in? They would say, wrong question. They would say, that involves the violation of the law court analogy that Wright repeats over and over again in the book. Um, it's not a matter of whose righteousness. God has his righteousness. It's his faithfulness to his covenant. And when you walk out of the law court, having been justified, it's your righteousness because it's your status proclaimed by the judge. He didn't have to give it to you. He proclaimed it for you. Now, of course, we immediately stop and go, excuse me, but the only way that works in the New Testament is that he proclaims that on the basis of the substitution of another in our place. Uh, that becomes central. But uh, I, I think probably, and I'm just sort of role-playing at that point, I think probably the response would be you're asking the wrong question. You're asking a question in a context that Paul would never have, con have even thought of and hence cannot be answered from their perspective. Yes, sir. You had mentioned um, <clears throat> earlier that uh, uh, John Armstrong was one of the people who had kind of caught on to this in reform circles. And I find that a little strange. I mean, I guess 
<clears throat> in the Presbyterian circles where they would have in common with Anglicans the uh, infant baptism and the other things that they can refer to as in terms of covenantal faithfulness. But, of course, Armstrong is not only Baptist, but he was the editor of a book that was responding to ECT talking about how all of this um, ecumenical movement to, to try to find common ground with Rome was just a horrible thing. I'm, I'm just very surprised to hear that he is he's interested in, in this at all. Uh, <coughs> you're not the only one. Uh, and yet, uh, some of you know that the, the last newsletter that was sent out from Reformation Revival Ministries that I received just last week, with sadness I began reading the the main article, and it was uh, it started off uh, speaking of his uh, theological change, the change that he's gone through, uh, and that one of the elements of that is that he has uh, abandoned the search for epistemological certitude. Um, similar to that first statement on page one, the best we can do is an approximate guess. Um, I don't know everything that took place in the, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, that led to this process there. Uh, all I know is that the Reformation Revival Journal carried two articles uh, interviewing N.T. Wright in a very positive fashion. Uh, in fact, that was the, the, uh, one of the things that I read in regards to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because the question came up there. Uh, there were other articles that were published by Presbyterian, a Presbyterian pastor uh, presenting a new perspectivist uh, uh, orientation. Uh, and within the past year, uh, a colleague of mine, a pastor in uh, the Chicago area, uh, directly asked uh, John Armstrong, do you believe in the necessity of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ? And he said, I do not, uh, that that is no longer a part of, of his perspective because that's not what N.T. Wright believes either. Uh, there is no, there is no uh, great transaction in that way. Um, it is... Uh, it is something that, uh, uh, you know, as I read that, uh, that article uh, just last week and uh, shook my head, uh, you know, I don't know what happened. Uh, I've only met the man, I think, twice and, and uh, don't really have, you know, much of a way of connection there. But uh, it is a, uh, it's a sobering thing. It's a sobering thing, and uh, it, it should cause us to, to realize that uh, uh, this needs to be taken seriously, and uh, it should cause us to uh, pray for God's grace in our own lives. Uh, I think it should also keep us from being overly concerned about individuals, though. Uh, in other words, if there are people who were blessed by what John Armstrong wrote in 1990 or 94 or whatever, um, what you should have been blessed by was God's truth that was proclaimed by John Armstrong at that point, not by John Armstrong the man. Um, we do tend to uh, fall into, in essence, man worship uh, and confuse the mere instrument that brings us a, a better understanding of God's truth with God's truth itself. And I, I hope this is a lesson to all of us uh, that uh, this, you know, Clark Pinnock was once a very strong, conservative, reformed writer. Uh, there is not an element of the reformed faith that he any longer holds at all. Uh, the man believes in post-mortem evangelization. He's, ne he's as close to a universalist as you can possibly go. Um, how does that kind of thing happen? Um, I can only tell you one thing. It's not because the Lord Jesus Christ lacked the ability to keep it from happening. That means there's a purpose in it happening. And uh, especially when it is a Christian leader, we need to learn what that purpose is. And um, for me, I think part of that is to recognize that uh, um, I may get the opportunity of standing up here and because of opportunities in my life may have the opportunity of studying things that other people can't. It doesn't make me special. I mean, um, I've heard people, I remember one radio preacher, no, it wasn't a preacher, it was a radio apologist. and It was so obvious from his perspective that if you didn't send him your 2250 this month, 
God's entire work on this plan was going to come to a screeching halt. You know, uh, if he got run over by a truck next week, the kingdom ends. You know, we might as well just throw up our hands and surrender uh, if he wasn't there. I, I just, uh, I, have a, I have a healthy view of myself. Uh, I'm, I could get run over by a truck tomorrow, and you know what? The kingdom's just going to keep on going. Just going to be minus one bald, fat dude. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we really need to, to be very careful that we don't, uh, you know, we tend, and let's face it, reform folks tend to get into name dropping. I saw R.C. Sproul recently. <laughs> you want to touch my reformed ring? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, big deal, you know. Uh, he has to put deodorant on like anybody else does, you know. It's just... The Lord gives us opportunities of doing things that other people don't get to do, and, and then we get to tell other folks, and it, we're all in this together, and the, 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 the ground is level at the foot of the cross, and, and we, we, need to, uh, we need to recognize that and stop idolizing folks. Um, I want to make this the last one for, uh, for today and let folks go, and then if anybody wants to ask me questions afterwards, they can, they can come down, and I can sit down and talk to them that way. The question I'd like to address is, Obviously, with the new perspective as presented by Wright, uh, the substitutionary atonement is not important. With the new perspective as embraced by some of our evangelical brothers, the, the atonement is still important, and they say that we receive the righteousness of Christ, but not by imputation. They say that we receive the righteousness of Christ through union with Christ. Um, you don't have to give a hard and fast answer, but where in your view, do you think we should begin to think about drawing the line and saying this is another gospel? Well, that is undoubtedly one of the hardest questions uh, to answer because, um, you know, when you're, when you're talking about individuals who would say that uh, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, he, is, he is, was incarnate, he died, was buried again, rose third the third day that he's coming again, that the Bible is the word of God, that a person must profess faith in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation, that, that uh, we are justified uh, solely by faith in Christ and not by any meritorious works which we might, uh, which we might present to God. Um, it, it, it is at that point that I, I think, for me personally, um, what I would uh, suggest in a situation like that is uh, you deal with the teaching and try to avoid searching for the special super duper I can recognize the elect sunglasses uh, that seemingly everybody wants to order from, uh, from their local reformed bookstore. Uh, in other words, um, I don't know the state of the heart or mind of an individual that you would talk about at that point. Uh, I would be willing to dialogue with such an individual and attempt to ask them, well, what is it about the imputation of Christ's righteousness that causes you a problem? Uh, what is it, uh, how is it that by participation in Christ, union with Christ, uh, that that righteousness which is his, his, his active obedience, uh, how is it that you have fulfilled the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? How have you fulfilled that? Uh, do you really believe that, that justification just takes you back to a moral neutral point and then you somehow... How do you fulfill the positive commands of, of, of God at that point? I'd want to ask further questions because I've not talked with someone who said that. Um, but at the same time, I, I think we need to, uh, I think our, our, our efforts and our energy are best expended uh, upon the proclamation of the truth uh, exegetically, carefully, consistently. And uh, I, I do, uh, especially, uh, th this comes up when, when I, I encounter Calvinists who are in the cage stage. You know what a cage stage Calvinist is? Uh, that's the Calvinist who just got done reading Arthur W. Pink's The Sovereignty of God and is now carrying a case of them with him in a backpack <laughs> and is chasing down every person he's ever talked to and is beating them over the head uh, with that or maybe the collected works of John Calvin or something else when that's all they can talk about. And they're going, you know what? I think all Arminians are going to hell in a handbasket, you know? And uh, I call those cage stage Calvinists. Uh, 
But they need to be put in a cage until they can learn a little grace, and then maybe we can let them out and they can, they can talk with us. But until then, they're embarrassing the rest of us. And um, uh, I have people who come in and, and they'll, go, they'll go, you know, uh, I heard someone, and I think, I think even though he says he's a five-pointer, I think he's a four-pointer, so I think he's, he's got Satan in him. And uh, I just want to calm down now. Kind of, you know, uh, I, at that point, sort of try to say to them, you know what, uh, it might be a little better for you if you uh, focused upon uh, uh, the truths of the faith rather than trying to figure out the spiritual condition of everybody around you based upon your particular understanding of certain things. And all that's just simply to, to state that, it, that um, I, think it's, I think we have all the foundation in the world to say this is the gospel and this isn't. Uh, but I don't think we can then go beyond that in some situations and say, and therefore this person must be on a bobsled to hell. Um, is there any one of us here who says we have an absolutely perfect understanding of all things? Um, anyone here who understands the Trinity perfectly? Okay, how many of you are Trinitarians? How many of you are Trinitarians? <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> I wandered into the local kingdom hall! <laughs> yeah, I'm a Trinitarian, what about it? Yeah. Let's be passionate about it. Yes, that's me right here, okay. Uh, no, I listen to Phillips, Craig, and Dean. Thank you. Uh, they're oneness, by the way. Um, and yet, how many of you who are Trinitarians put your hand up when I ask for a perfect knowledge of the Trinity? So you can be something and not claim to have an absolutely perfect knowledge. They're, they're, I try to err on, on the recognition of the fact that I, I can't look into persons' hearts and minds. I want to stick with what the Scripture says. And in my mind, when you start trying to deal with stuff you can't really, you can't really address directly from Scripture, like, well, I wonder what the state of that person's soul is. You're not spending time in the exegesis of the text. And so I, I think it's far better to to stay there uh, and to uh, uh, trust people to look to the Word of God and make the decisions from there, then uh, the other stuff almost always ends up leading to just a massive amount of emotion. And I haven't found that folks are really able to do good exegesis of the text of Scripture when their mind is all a muddle uh, with, with emotion. Um, so uh, that, I, I think that's probably the best, uh, the best direction to go there. When they open the, uh, the thing to the nursery, that's when you know it's time uh, to wrap everything up. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Pastor. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.